بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار so we are on uh, lesson 28 i believe uh, in the series on uh, the book by Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah uh, kitab al-ubudiyah the book of servitude and um obviously we've um got around halfway through this book and so I'm not sure how many people have um attended which lessons but basically the book is speaking about worship and enslavement and one of the central points that the book that Ibn Taymiyyah is putting across is to make a distinction between the slavery of the body enslavement of the body and enslavement of the heart so the body can be enslaved you can be put into chains you can be put into prison you can be physically restrained so this is slavery of the body this is one type but there's another type of enslavement which is actually more severe and more intense and more dangerous and so this is the enslavement of the heart and so the heart can be enslaved to many different things and this enslavement can take place in relation to things which are lawful halal within that context and also to things which are unlawful as well so from the examples that Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah gave in some of the previous uh, lessons early in the book is to illustrate for example between uh, a husband and a wife right a man and a woman and so this is in a, in a lawful relationship right in marriage so it's perfectly halal and so what happens is is that whereas the man is you know he's the uh, the husband the one in charge the one who outwardly is you know dominating and and you know uh, the, the one who bas- who's basically in charge inwardly his heart is actually captivated by the woman right it's it's enslaved and captivated by the woman so he is really a servant to the woman rather than the other way around right outwardly it appears that the man is in charge but really it's the woman who's in control because he's the one who's become enslaved right and and often sometimes women can be aware of that and take advantage of that right so he gave that example earlier on in the you know in the treaties that's one example but that's in a lawful relationship that's when it's actually halal it's even worse when it is in relation to things which are haram so this is when you know a person becomes attached to you know uh, the opposite you know sex and becomes infatuated and captivated and you know indulges in things which are unlawful so you know this this is a type of punishment uh, upon a person in this life moving on from that he went on to discuss other situations where a person can become captivated by physical material things and so from the examples he gave from the hadith uh, wretched is the worshiper of the dinar wretched is the worshiper of the dirham to the end of, of of the hadith right and then you know he mentions uh, silk cloth and other types of luxurious cloth so he was speaking here about people who become attached to material possessions physical possessions right someone um likes wealth hoarding wealth someone likes luxurious clothing or luxurious items right so he becomes captivated and enslaved by pursuing these things if they come to him he becomes pleased if they don't come to him he becomes angry right so now his pleasure and his anger 
is determined by material things, it doesn't follow the pleasure and anger of Allah Zawajal. So this now is also a type of enslavement. The heart is enslaved to something else, and there's a competition in the heart between between attachment to that thing and attachment to Allah Zawajal. Right? So this is where we start entering into the realm of you know what is minor shirk, minor shirk, where the heart is attached to other things besides Allah. That's another example he gave. Um, and then he also spoke about um, in the previous lesson that we looked into, uh, he was speaking about um, again the issue of unlawful attachment to you know unlawful things. And uh, we, we looked at the issue of the prayer, we spoke about the prayer in the previous um, in the salat tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar that the prayer is something that prohibits you from you know falling into these types of uh, lusts and desires so the general idea that you should uh, know before we continue is that in this book we are speaking about the slavery of the heart and how a person can become enslaved by physical material things and some of them can be lawful, some of them can be unlawful, and it can apply to um, lusts and desires. It can apply to wealth, as we shall see. It can also apply to power and status. All of these things are things in which a man or a woman can have aspirations. He can have goals, he can have desires, right? And he becomes embroiled in these things and they take him away from enslavement to Allah Azawajal, right? And so in the heart, there's a competition now, competition between, you know, uh, enslavement to Allah and enslavement to these things and pursuing these things. And that's the, 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 the general essence of what the book is explaining to us. So the point at which we commence today, lesson number 28, is where Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he is now speaking about the issue of leadership. Seeking leadership, right? Seeking power. This is another one of those issues in which a person can become a slave. Or he can be, you know, he can become uh, captivated. How does this happen? So Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he explains to us, he says, وَكَذَلِكَ طَالِبُ الرِّئَاسَةِ وَالْعُلُو فِي الْأَرْضِ قَلْبُهُ رَقِيقٌ لِمَنْ يُعِينُهُ عَلِيهَا وَلَوْ كَانَ فِي الظَّاهِرِ مُقَدَّمَهُمْ وَالْمُطَاعَ فِيهِمْ فَهُوَ فِي الْحَقِيقَةِ يَرْجُوهُمْ وَيَخَافُهُمْ فَيَبْذُلُ لَهُمُ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْوِلَايَاتِ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْهُمْ لِيُطِيعُوهُ وَيُعِينُوهُ فَهُوَ فِي الظَّاهِرِ رَئِيسٌ مُطَاعٌ وَفِي الْحَقِيقَةِ عَبْدٌ مُطِيعٌ لَهُمْ So in this passage, what Ibn Taymi says is that likewise from the examples of where enslavement to other than Allah happens is the one who seeks power, he seeks leadership and he seeks highness upon the earth. So his heart is in reality a slave, it is captivated to whoever is going to help him and aid him in reaching that leadership. Right? So sometimes you have, you have men and they want power on the earth, they want authority on the earth. And so they seek it, they pursue it. And along the way, they need people to help them. Because obviously, you can't achieve power you know, on your own, especially the type of power that, you know, uh, is over many thousands or you know millions of people. So along the way, he needs other people to help him. And these people, as Ibn Taymi says, he continues, um, that he is in reality a slave to those people, right? He is in need of those people. So he is a slave to them. He's, he's captivated by them. And he says, even if outwardly it appears that they are obeying him. 
So even though they appear to be serving his needs and serving his goals, inwardly in terms of when we look at the heart, what's happening is that he, in his heart, his heart fears them, hopes in them, depends upon them, is in need of them. So when you look at the heart, that's what's really happening in his heart, right? He is the one who's the slave in terms of what's happening inwardly. Even though outwardly he appears to be their chief, their leader, their boss, the one whom they obey, the one whom, you know, this is what's happening. So Ibn Taymi is pointing out this reality. He says, even though outwardly he appears to be the one at the front, the one who obeys them, um, the one who is obeyed by them, he is in reality the one who hopes them, hopes in them and fears them. And he basically gives them wealth and you know he gives them positions of leadership and also if they make mistakes or they do things wrong he'll forgive them and he'll overlook them right why because he is in need of them right so he's willing to even suffer harms or violations because he's so much in need of them right so he says outwardly he appears to be a leader who is obeyed but in reality he is a slave who obeys them, right? Who who obeys them, meaning the people whom he is in need of. So, Sheikh Salih al fawzan he comments upon this passage, and he just elaborates somewhat upon this uh, paragraph, and he says that this man, in order to reach leadership and highness on the earth, you know, he wants to get it no matter which way, through any means possible. Even if this leads to him basically, you know, being captivated and submitting to people, right, to his aiders, to his helpers, to his supporters, right, to, so he's willing to go to that length. So that, for example, in some situations, one of the ways where this applies is, for example, politicians, members of parliament, whether in the Muslim countries or non-Muslim countries, right? So these guys, they're after power, they want leadership, and they know that they can't get leadership except by way of people voting for him. So what happens is he goes out there and, you know, he, he's, he, he, he makes it appear or he lowers himself, and um, because he needs their votes, because he needs their support, then he is, you know, his whims will follow their whims, right? To the degree that he might have, for example, his own values, but he's willing to compromise them to please the people in order to get their votes, right? So, for example, he might have certain positions on certain things. Uh, to give an example here, you know, might have a position on... Um, you know, on, on uh, you know, gender, for example, or on other controversial things. But he's willing to compromise that because he wants the support of the people. In fact, this is what you see in many of these non-Muslim uh, politicians. That's what, what they do. They'll, they'll come to and try and find the Muslim vote, right? So they'll come to the mosque and they'll start speaking about things that Muslims want to hear. They're not sincere. They just want your vote, Right? So they'll come to the mosque and say, yes, you know, and then they'll speak with things that Muslims want to hear. Because they're just after your vote and they just want to get into power. And once they get into power, then, you know, you know it's a different story. So these people who are in this type of position, they, they are really, um, they are slaves to the people whom they want to uh, vote them in. Right? That's the reality of what the situation is. Even though it appears that they are the ones who are basically, you know, in, in, in charge and whatever. So this is the general idea. And um, uh, Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan continues and he says, yes, these people, you know, they, they, um, they want votes in the elections. And, you know, it appears that they are the ones who are in charge and in lead. But in reality, in terms of the inward reality, they are simply captivated by their audiences. Uh, then he continues and he says that sometimes there's a situation where those people in charge might give 
their, you know, um, they might give wealth and they might give them positions, they might give them inflated salaries, right? They might give them certain jobs because he wants to please them because he is in need of them, right? If they turn against him, his power is gone. And that's why you see in many situations like in history, in reality, and even today, you see that many of those who, who are in authority, the, the, the true power doesn't actually lie with them. It's other people who are holding them in power. Right. So, knowing this, that leader is a slave to those people because he knows that his source of power and authority comes from those people. So, he is a slave to them. Right, and it can also be vice versa. They are also enslaved to him as well because it, it actually works both ways, as Ibn Taymiyyah explained shortly. So Sheikh Salih al Khuzan he says that um, that even these people whom he depends upon, they might make mistakes, they might make errors, they might make violations, they might break the law, they might do different things, but because he is in need of them, he'll overlook them. Right, and this is what you see again at, at the higher levels. You see corruption and things like that, and the the, the crimes and the mistakes of certain people are uh, they're they're allowed to go ahead. Why? Because they are in need of the support of those people to stay and to remain in power. And so that's what you see nowadays in terms of what we see, and especially in these Western. Uh, democracies where they have lobbying you have lobbies right you have these powerful lobbies you have the pharmaceutical lobby right you have uh, such, such and such political lobby that's after a political obje ob objective right these people might be engaged in crimes right but because the politician needs the support of these people they'll give him donations they'll give him this they'll support his campaign they are they are willing to overlook right so, so all of these things you can see how it how how it, how it can basically take place. Um, so Sheikh Saleh Al Fozan continues commenting, and you know he said he says that if this ruler or leader didn't give to those people these things like positions and wealth and whatever, then you know they would abandon him and leave him, and his source of authority and power would be gone, would disappear, right? And he would not be able to fulfill his objectives without them. And um, then Ibn Taymi says, after this passage, so we're back to the speech of Ibn Taymi now, rahimahullah, he says, وَالتَّحْقِيقْ أَنَّ كِلَاهُمَا فِيهِ عُبُودِيَّةٌ لِلْآخَرِ وَكِلَاهُمَا تَارِكٌ لِحَقِيكَةِ عِبَادَةِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا كَانَ تَعَاوُنُهُمَا عَلَى الْعُلُوِّ فِي الْعَرْضِ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ كَانَ بِمَنْزَلَةِ الْمُتَعَاوِنِينَ عَلَى الْفَاحِشَةِ أَوْ قَطْعِ الطَّرِيقِ فَكُلُّ وَاحِدٍ مِنَ مِنَ الشَّخْصَيْنِ لِهَوَاهُ الَّذِي اسْتَعْبَدَهُ وَاسْتَرَقَّهُ يَسْتَعْبِدُهُ الْآخِرُ right, So this is the second part of the passage. What, what he says now is that the reality of the affair in this whole scenario is that each of these two parties, each of these two groups, the one seeking the power and the one helping him to give the power, both of them are in fact slaves to each other. They are slaves to each other. And both of them have abandoned the reality of servitude to Allah. Right? In engaging in this behavior, both of these parties have abandoned true enslavement, true captivation to Allah Azza wa Jal. And if they were to do this in things which are unlawful, such as for example, some people want corruption, they want just authority upon the earth, they want power by any means possible, they want to be above other people, they want to be, you know, they want to dominate uh, people and crush them and use them, right? If this is the reason why they're doing it, then, you know, upon other than the truth, then now they are cooperating. They are, they are in co cooperation upon evil, upon corruption, upon what is, you know, uh, uh, sin, right? And cutting off the path. So basically what's happened here, as he says, each of these two groups, 
they are both following their desires. And when one person has been enslaved by his desires, it leads the other person to be enslaved as well. It's working both ways, right? Now I'm going to stop here and I'm going to give you another modern day example of how this applies. And then we'll come back to this discussion of of, of uh, Sheikh Salil Fawzan commenting on the speech, right? So I'm going to give you another illustration. And it, a good illustration of what Ibn Taymi is discussing here is social media. Social media and social media personalities. Right? So you have these social media personalities. They have millions of followers and you find them in the Muslim world. You find them, you know, everywhere in every society. Right? So they've developed thousands, millions of followers. And outwardly to an observer, it seems like they are the ones being followed and obeyed and basically people are captivated by them. But it also works the other way around. Right? These personalities are also enslaved by the expectations of their audiences. Right? So the audience is actually enslaving the personality. And the personality, what the personality is doing, is just doing things to please the audience. Because without the audience, that personality doesn't have the fame, doesn't have the fortune, doesn't have the income streams. So if that person was to say or do something that the audience doesn't like, that personality will be cancelled. You'll be cancelled, you're done, right? So you see this ha happening often. Right? So some personality comes along and says something, well, I believe marriage is between a man and a woman. That personality now is cancelled, right? And, you know, loses so many followers because of the, you know, some personalities, they know this, and so they're very careful about what they say. So really, you know, this shows that they are a slave to the audience. Right? And they are subservient to the audience's expectations. And they are acting in order to satisfy the whims of the audience. So really what's happening is that this one is enslaved and that audience is also enslaved. They're captivated to each other. It works both ways. Right? So this is the type of thing that Ibn Taymiyyah is alluding to here. And obviously we know uh, at a basic level, this happens in relation to lusts, happens in relation to desires, happens in relation to wealth, happens in relation to power, happens in relation to like, you know, status and, and fame, right? It happens in all of these different things. But then the way it manifests, the way it actually takes place in reality, it, you know, happens in many different ways, right? A ruler and his subject, a husband and his wife. Um, you know, and, and here in, in the modern era uh, that we live in, there are many manifestations of that uh, as well. So, coming back now with, with, with that diversion, coming back to this issue of uh, the one who seeks power, and he's aided in that by helpers and supporters, and how they are both subservient to each other. Uh, Sheikh Saleh al Fawzan, he comments upon all of this. And he says that the, these, these two parties, these two groups of people, um, we find that the reason behind all of this is that the hearts of both of these parties are attached to other than Allah. Right? The ta'alluq, the true attachment, is not completely to Allah, it is to other than Allah. And... Um, if these people had relied upon Allah and made their hearts attachment only to Allah then they would not be in the situation where they are captivated and enslaved to other than Allah. As we see in the Quran, وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَزْبُهُ Whoever relies upon Allah, Allah will be sufficient for him. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ Indeed, Allah will reach his 
affair. He will reach, you know, the affair. So he says the believer, his heart is always attached to Allah Azawajal. He obeys Allah and he knows that if he obeys Allah and seeks to please Allah Azawajal, then the other people will obey him. Right? This is how it works. If you seek to please Allah Azawajal, you fear him, you uh, uh, obey him, you uh, fulfill his commands, then a consequence of that is that Allah will make other people follow you, right? So you, you don't seek to make the people follow you, you seek to follow the guidance of Allah Azawajal, and Allah will then make people uh, respect you and uh, follow you and to listen to your speech and so on and so forth. So the believer, he says, his heart is always attached to Allah Azawajal, and that's why we see in the hadith, a very important hadith in this context, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, مَنِ الْتَمَسَ رِضَ اللَّهِ بِسَخَطِ النَّاسِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ وَأَرْضَ النَّاسَ عَنْهُ Whoever seeks to please Allah at the expense of displeasing the people, then Allah will be pleased with him and he will cause the people to be pleased with him as well. And he said, وَمَنِ الْتَمَسَ رِضَ النَّاسِ بِسَخَطِ اللَّهِ سَخَطَ اللَّهُ عَلِيهِ وَأَسْخَطَ عَلِيهِ النَّاسِ But whoever seeks to please the people at the expense of angering Allah, displeasing Allah, then, then Allah will be displeased with him and he will make the people displeased with him as well. So this shows that a believer always seeks to please Allah Azawajal, irrespective of whether it's going to displease the people or anger the people. He doesn't look at that, right? Because his heart is not attached to those people or to material physical things, right? His, his, his pleasure and his anger isn't determined by other things. It's determined by what pleases and what displeases Allah Azawajal. And that's why this type of person, it is impossible to enslave this type of person. You can't enslave this type of person. The one whose pleasure and his anger follows what Allah is pleased with and what, what, what angers Allah. Right? So, so this person cannot be corrupted. Uh, he cannot be bought. He cannot be, uh, you know, made... Um, a slave to his own desires, like you see, like you see among the people in general, the common people, and likewise even the people uh, like the politicians, you see that they, they can be quite easily bought because they have tastes, they have desires, they have weaknesses, they have whims, their pleasure and displeasure is, is on the basis of these physical and material things, so they can be very easily bought. Right? So a believer is not like this, a believer's heart is always attached to Allah Azawajal, and um, for that reason, his, his uh, pleasure and his anger will always be for, for the sake of Allah Azawajal. And he will not fear the blame of anybody. Um, having said this, the Shaykh does make an important clarification. He says that um, this doesn't mean that you can't, uh, you know, get the, the help and assistance from other people. Right, so it doesn't mean that you just abandon everybody and, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't get assistance and help from other people, of course you can. But your heart is not attached to them, it is attached to Allah Azawajal. So sometimes you can be in need of the assistance of other people, financially or in terms of other things, that's fine. As long as your heart is not attached to those things or to those people, then you know you you, you can uh, get the aid and the assistance and the support of the people. There's nothing wrong with this. What we are speaking of here is when the heart becomes attached to other than Allah, and your pleasure and your displeasure is determined by things other than Allah's pleasure and displeasure, by material things, by physical things, by you know things of that nature that we've been discussing. So after this. Um, Ibn Taymiyyah ta he then goes on to now move on to another arena and this is now the issue of wealth 
Because the same thing can apply in the issue of wealth. So he says, وَهَكَذَا أَيْدًا طَالِبُ الْمَالِ فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ يَسْتَعْبِدُهُ وَيَسْتَرِقُهُ Likewise wealth. Because the one who seeks wealth, then this can also enslave him and captivate him. And then he says, وَهَذِهِ الْأُمُورِ نَوْعَانِ Right, so these types as it relates to wealth, there are, there are two categories as it relates to wealth. So before we look at those two categories, Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan, he, he just comments upon this, uh, this sentence, and he says that when the heart is attached to wealth, and the love of wealth, then a man will try to achieve wealth through any means possible, through whatever means possible, whether it is halal, whether it is haram, whether it is through stealing, whether it is through gambling, whether it is through games of chance, whether it is through bribery, right? all of these are unlawful ways of achieving wealth. So he will attain wealth through any means possible because of his intense love and intense desire for wealth. So this means that he is basically a worshipper of wealth. Right? He's He's ensla- with the meaning that he's enslaved by wealth. And thus, he will anger Allah, he, he will seek wealth at the expense of angering Allah Azawajal. He will use certain ways and means which anger Allah Azawajal. And uh, as for the believer, how does the believer behave, behave? The believer, we know that Allah Azawajal has mentioned in the Quran, وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّا This is the nature of man, Allah Azawajal, He's put in man the love of wealth. Right? He loves wealth, it's one of the things that he likes to have. This is, this is like a, a, an innate uh, desire for wealth. Every man wants wealth, loves wealth. But he doesn't put wealth ahead of the love of Allah Azawajal. And that's the distinction line. Right? The person who's enslaved to wealth, he's put wealth, the love of wealth, ahead of love of Allah Azawajal. And this then, this then will, will cause him to use any means possible, theft, bribery, gambling, you know, so on and so forth, to, to acquire wealth. Whereas the believer, he knows he has a need of wealth, he knows he loves wealth, who doesn't love wealth? But he knows where the limit is. And he knows that his heart's attachment to wealth is limited and it does not exceed the heart's attachment to Allah so so for that reason he will readily abandon and keep away from things which are unlawful he will leave riba usury interest right he will leave deception lying theft treachery gambling games of chance you know betting things like that he will leave all of that and, you know, his love of wealth will not lead him to these things. He only benefits from things which are lawful, wholesome, even if he only acquires a small amount, you know, or a little amount. Allah will put, will put barakah in that thing. He will put blessing in that thing. But as for things which are acquired unlawfully, even if they are great and lots of wealth, but they are acquired unlawfully, then there will be no barakah in that thing. Right, they will be deprived of barakah. As Allah Zawajal He says, Yamhaqullahu riba wa yurbi sadaqat. Allah Zawajal has, you know, He will erase the, the riba, but He will cause the charity to grow, to multiply. Right, because the riba is unlawful. And uh, Sheikh Salaf Ozan continues and He says, Sometimes a man can acquire tremendous amount of wealth. But it will not benefit him neither in his religion, nor in his world, nor in the hereafter. Right? He just he's into acquiring wealth, making wealth, you know, this business, then another business, then he keeps growing and growing. growing. He, his life is just engaged in, in acquiring more and more wealth. But it doesn't benefit him in his religion, nor in his worldly affairs, nor in the hereafter. And all that's gonna happen is that you're gonna die and the wealth is going to go to someone after you. So you, ben- you didn't benefit from the, from, from the wealth. All you did was spend a lifetime or decades just acquiring more and more and more and more.
but it didn't really benefit you in any great way. And at the end of it, you're going to die, and it's going to go to somebody else anyway. So the important thing is, the Sheikh says, is, um, you know, to these types of people, is they want to gather the wealth in any way possible. And um, however, the person who wants to be blessed by Allah you know, he will only um, acquire wealth by way of lawful means and his heart will be content and he will be satisfied. So now we come to the issue to do with wealth because Ibn Taymi said that this whole issue of pursuing wealth, there's two types of wealth that people pursue. The first one he says, uh, these affairs to do with wealth are of two types. بل بمنزلة الكنيف الذي يقضى يقضي فيه حاجته من غير أن يستعبده فيكون حلوءا إذا مسه الشر جزوعا وإذا مسه الخير منوعا. So this is the first type of wealth that he's talking about. He says the first type of wealth is the wealth which is necessary and vital. This is necessary and vital wealth. You need to acquire it. For your food, for your drink, for your uh, resi- you know where, where you live, for a, a shelter, and for marriage, right? For marriage, these are the essentials that a person needs: food, drink, shelter, and marriage. And so, th- a person can have an aspiration. You can have a desire for these things. It's natural, and you can pursue these things, and. You use these, so, so, so the way that you use the wealth that you acquire is exactly in the same way, for example, that, you know, you have a donkey and you need the donkey to ride upon for a purpose, right? It's for a purpose. It serves an objective. Or, um, like a rug, for example, you, you need a rug, you know, to give you a little bit of uh, acceptable comfort, like, like a bed or a rug. Or, like even, for example, a person needs a place to relieve himself. It's a necessity, right? So this type of wealth that you acquire is used in the way that would that you would use these types of things. It's a necessity, right? And um, so this is the first type. And so the Sheikh, Sheikh Al-Khawzan, he comments upon this and he says that so he says that, look, we, we are speaking here about not becoming attached and enslaved to wealth. This does not mean, this doesn't mean now that we have to just abandon wealth altogether. It doesn't mean that. And that we just, you know, st- stay in the mosque or stay in the house and just praying all the time, right? So we don't become ascetics. We don't become like monks. We don't abandon the world. This is not what Islam calls to. Right? So this is why there is this tafsil or this clarification of the types of wealth. So it, it doesn't mean that. But rather, to seek wealth, to seek sustenance, is itself from worship. This itself is ibadah, to seek wealth and sustenance. And a person is actually rewarded. So when you go out to work and seek lawful earnings to feed yourself, your family and to do all these obligations, food, drink, clothing, shelter, and marriage, and whatever else, you are actually engaged in ibadah. This is worship now. This is actual worship. And um, a servant is rewarded for that. Right? So what you are doing is you are seeking what's going to help you in your deen, in worshipping Allah, as long as it is you know, in relation to um, something which is lawful and wholesome. And as um, the Shaykh continues, and he says, obviously, this is by way of lawful means. And um, 
He then continues and he says, a person is in need of food and drink and clothing, obviously, and a shelter and likewise marriage. And all of this cannot be achieved except by way of wealth. So seeking wealth obviously is a necessity. And um, this wealth is basically like a servant to you. It's a means that you use. No different to a rug that you use or a donkey that you use for transport or a lavatory that you use to, to you know, relieve yourself. This is the nature of wealth, right? It's to be used for a purpose, for an end, and it isn't something that you seek in and of itself. Um, your heart doesn't become attached to it. And, um, you know, like, the way you should be, in fact, in the Quran, Allah Zawajal, He mentions, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ خُلِقَ حَلُوعًا إِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرْ جَزُوعًا وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الْخَيْرْ مَنُوعًا Right, so here Allah Zawajal is describing one of the, you know, the, the properties and characteristics of man. That man is created impatient. To be impatient and hasty is one of his qualities. And when evil afflicts him, when evil afflicts him, he becomes like, he becomes irritable and he falls into despair. And when goodness comes to him, he becomes greedy and niggardly, doesn't want to spend, right? So the, these, are, these are three qualities that you find in general that they, you know, it's like a property of man. That generally you are impatient and hasty. Generally, when um, evil, some harm comes to you, you become very impatient and despair. And when goodness comes to you, you don't want to spend. You become tight and niggardly. It's just the character of 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 a of of, of man. So he says that. The believer, uh, you know, he, 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 he's not like this. He doesn't become attached to wealth. If it comes to him, it comes to him. If it doesn't, it doesn't come to him. It doesn't start making him angry and despair. You know, he, he submits to the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal. His heart never becomes attached to the thing itself. Even though he needs it, right? He needs it for food, clothing, drink, shelter, right? So this is how a believer, this is his interaction with wealth, right? It is a healthy interaction, right? Which is governed by, you know, his his uh, his pleasure and displeasure, angry and becoming pleased, is governed by what Allah is angry and pleased with, right? And so it's a healthy relationship with wealth, as opposed to the unhealthy relationship with wealth that we've been discussing discussing earlier on. Then he goes on to discuss the second type, and the second type, he says, وَمِنْهَا The second type is, he says, وَمِنْهَا مَا لَا يَحْتَاجُ الْعَبْدُ إِلَيْهِ فَهَذِهِ لَا يَنْبَغِي لَهُ أَنْ يُعَلِّقَ قَلْبَهُ بِهَا فَإِذَا تَعَلَّقَ قَلْبَهُ بِهَا سَارَ مُسْتَعْبَدًا لَهَا وَرُبَّمَا سَارَ مُعْتَمِدًا عَلَى غَيْرِ اللَّهِ فَلَا يبقى معه حقيقة العبادة لله ولا حقيقة التوكل عليه بل فيه شعبة من العبادة لغير الله وشعبة من التوكل على غير الله وهذا وهذا من أحق الناس بقوله صلى الله عليه وسلم تعيس عبد الدرهم تعيس عبد الدينار تعيس عبد القطيفة Abdul Khamisa. So this passage now, he's speaking about the second type of wealth now. First type of wealth, essentials, food, drink, clothing, marriage, shelter, whatever. Right? You pursue it, your heart doesn't become attached to it. If it comes to you, good. Right? Uh, praise, thank Allah Azza wa Jal. If it doesn't come to you, have sabr. Right? Your anger and pleasure is, you know, follows Allah's anger and pleasure. Second type of wealth is that which the servant is not in need of. Right? It's not essential, you, you don't need it for your essentials. This 
your heart shouldn't be attached to, right? So the first type of wealth, we said, yes, your heart can desire it and pursue it. Why? Because it's essential. The attachment should be a healthy attachment. This one, your heart shouldn't be attached to it. And if your heart becomes attached to it, then it will become enslaved by it, by that wealth, by seeking that wealth. And perhaps you might even start depending upon other than Allah, right? And so now when this ties starts to happen, then what happens is that the reality of worship in the heart, then it starts to, you know, you start to lose it. And it doesn't remain in the heart anymore. And the reality of tawakkal upon Allah doesn't remain anymore. And even it can go to the extent, <clears throat> it can go to the extent that it actually becomes worship, right? So your pursuit of that wealth, which is not necessary for you, it can go to the level where it actually becomes worship. And that's why we see in the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu the same hadith that we mentioned earlier, where he said, May he, may the worshipper of the dirham perish. May he be wretched. May the worshipper of the dinar perish. May the worshipper of the, you know, the atifa and the khamisa, these are types of luxurious like clothing, like silk clothing, silk cloth and whatever else, right? So what's being mentioned here is that there are certain types of people, they are engrossed and they are captivated by these material physical things and increasing in these physical things, right? These are examples given by the messenger of Allah Sallallahu right? You know, of, of, of the dirham and dinar and cloth, right? But this applies... This applies to many things. It applies, for example, someone is, you know, wants to collect cars. He's after luxurious cars because he's got so much wealth, right? Someone likes his sneakers and his trainers. He's collecting these sneakers and trainers because they, you know, they, they, they have a, you know, a status and value or whatever this might be. People are captivated by these things. And so they become, they become a slave and worshippers of these things, right? So, so this second type of wealth, this is the nature of this second type of wealth. The when you pursue this type of wealth, which is not necessary, and your heart becomes attached to it, then you know this is uh, this is the second type. So Sheikh Al Fawzan comments upon this uh, passage, and inshallah we'll finish our lesson with this uh, commentary of Sheikh Al Fawzan. So he says Al Qism Thani, the second type of uh, wealth, ma yazido ma yazido an hajati, uh, which is that which is beyond whatever his need is. So he says, um, it's lawful for you to pursue it. Yes, you can. There's nothing to say that you can't pursue it. But your heart should not be attached to it. Right? Your heart shouldn't be attached to it. Otherwise, he will become just like the person mentioned in the hadith. May he perish the worshipper of the dinar. May he perish the worshipper of the dirham. Right, that hadith. So, you know, this person shouldn't cause his heart to be attached to these things. If they come to him, alhamdulillah, if they do not come to him, it doesn't affect him at all. He doesn't become unhappy, he doesn't become angry, he doesn't become angry at the decree of Allah. Why didn't this wealth come to me? And why, does it, you know, he doesn't become displeased, right? Because his heart's not attached to, the, to, uh, attached to these things to begin with. So, um, he continues to say that um, when the heart becomes to these types of things in this manner, it actually becomes a type and a form of worship. And a Muslim, in summary, is someone who worships Allah Zawajal and he seeks lawful wealth in a lawful manner. This is something Allah has commanded us in the Quran, right? So seeking wealth in a lawful manner is not prohibited. Right, but it's, it's commanded in the Quran. Allah Zawajal, He said, "Fabtahu inda Allah rizq wa'budu." Seek sustenance from Allah and worship Him. Right, very clear, very clear command in the Quran. And He said, "Fa'ida qudiyat al-salat, fantashiru fil ard wa btahu min fadlillah." When the prayer is finished, meaning the Jum'ah, when it is finished, then spread through the earth and seek from the bounty of Allah. This means go and, and trade and acquire wealth and, you know, uh, seek, you know, uh, do tijara. Um, 
and many other verses which are like this in the Quran, uh, but also it is mentioned in balance. Allah Zujal, He says, لا تلهيهم تجارة ولا بيع عن ذكر الله. So alongside being encouraged to go and earn rizq and seek rizq, like you saw in these verses, there's also another verse which says that, that there are men who are not distracted or diverted by trade or selling from the remembrance of Allah. So this now is in balance, right? So we are commanded to go and seek wealth, but not to be distracted away from the remembrance of Allah when we seek wealth, right? And that's the, you know, that's, that's the cutting off the, the line. We see also, um, لا تلهكم أموالكم ولا أولادهم عن ذكر الله. Do not let your wealth nor your offspring divert you from the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تلهكم أموال أموالكم ولا أولادكم عن ذكر الله. Or you who believe the same verse. Do not let your wealth and your offspring divert you away from the remembrance of Allah. وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ Whoever does that, then they will be the losers. رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْءٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ You know, we've uh, mentioned that verse before. So the point being from all of this, the shaykh continues, uh, which is that uh, a servant, obviously, his attachment to, is to Allah Azza wa Jal, and whenever a servant goes beyond these limits which have been defined in these verses, not being diverted away from Allah's remembrance, once you go beyond that, and your heart now becomes attached to this second type of wealth, this now starts becoming worship, right? It starts becoming minor shirk, because your heart now has exceeded the limits and become attached to other than Allah So inshallah, we will finish at this point here, today's lesson. So in essence, uh, today we've discussed uh, two things which the heart can become attached to, which is the pursuit of power, the pursuit of position. It doesn't just apply to, for example, a man wanting to become a ruler or a leader of a nation. It can apply to many situations. It can apply, for example, someone is wanting to seek a, a, a certain position in employment, for example, right? And so wanting to reach that position in employment, like a promotion or something like this, he's happy to please certain people. He knows that he needs to please certain people in order to get to that, you know, promotion or that position. So he basically starts, you know, um, you know, um, you know, he's subservient to them. His heart becomes captivated by them. So this can apply in many different scenarios and situations. The point being, the essential point being, your heart should only be attached to Allah Azza wa Jal. And um, whatever comes to you, whatever doesn't come to you, that's not the basis for you becoming pleased or angry. Right? You becoming pleased or angry about what does come to you and what doesn't come to you, that follows on from what makes Allah angry and what makes Allah pleased. Right? But you are content with Al-Qadr and you take only the lawful means you do not allow your heart to become attached to other than Allah. Right? And you obviously every person knows this inwardly in your own heart. You know, you know, when these feelings start creeping into your heart, right? So you so you know where, where, where the limits are. So, uh, uh, seeking power and also seeking wealth. And wealth is obviously of two types. That which is essential, what you need, and that which is beyond what you need. And so that wealth... When it comes to you, it doesn't come to you, you gain it, you lose it, it doesn't, you know, you don't become angry and, and, and displeased with Al-Qadr because it didn't come to you or you lost it or whatever, right? So all of this is, is showing us how we behave in relation to these things in order to remain in Ubudiyah to Allah Azza wa Jal, right? So we're not taken away from Ubudiyah to Allah, you know, away from that to servitude to other than Allah because it is it is harmful. So we'll finish on that point inshallah we'll continue in the next lesson. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.